Okay, this video is about polysaccharides. Um, we need to know four polysaccharides, but let me just remind you of what polymer means. So here I've got a dimer, this one's maltose, two monosaccharides, those two hexagons, joined together by a glycosidic linkage. Now I've put the carbon numbers on to remind you that if we've got a carbon number one with the OH group joined to it, then we could do another one of those condensation reactions there and make another one for glycosidic linkage. And we've got a carbon 4 with an OH group. And if we had another carbon 1 there, again, we could do, we could add on some more of these monomers. So we're adding lots and lots of monomers together. We're going to make a polymer because we're talking about sugars joining together monosaccharides. We're going to make polysaccharides. Now, there are four polysaccharides that you need to know. Two of them are used for storing lots of glucose units in the cell. Uh, they are starch and glycogen. And two of them are used more structurally to make structures. So, I'm going to start with uh, starch, which is a lovely plant storage compound. So this is the one that I think you're probably most familiar with and have done at GCSE. Um, certainly in terms of, I think you all know the enzyme that is used to make starch. So, starch is formed from alpha glucose units, big long line of them joined all together. So the monomer is alpha glucose. Now that's really important, you do need to know that it's alpha glucose. And just ignoring this top bit of the diagram for the minute, if we join lots and lots of alpha glucoses together, because of the bond angles, what we form is a lovely spiral molecule. So each one of these little green dots, and this is the picture out of your booklet, represents one glucose monomer. We've got big long chain and they form spirals. Now the reason that they form spirals is the bond angle forms a curve. And then you've got all these lovely uh, hydroxyl groups sticking out and so they can form hydrogen bonds to keep it into a nice spiral shape. Amylose is one component of starch. Starch is quite unusual. It's got two main components. The other sort of bond that forms uh, in starch is a one, what we call a 1-6 link. So 1-4 links between carbons number 1 and 4. If we bonded the carbon number 6 OH group to a carbon number 1, we get a 1-6 glycosidic link. So now we've got a sort of a spiral of our 1-4 linkages, but we've got a little branch off. So actually, our other component of starch, so we've got amylose, just a spiral, is we've got a myelopectin, where we've got our curves going into spirals, of the 1-4 linkages and every so often we've got a little branch off to a 1-6 link and then some more 1-4 links after that. So obviously, just going back to this diagram, if we've got a carbon number 4 free, we could add more glucose units to that. So the advantage of having branches is that we've got far more ends to take glucose off so it will release energy a bit more rapidly Amylose, we tend to break down into these dimer units of maltose first and then use another enzyme to break it down. It's a bit slower, you can only take things off the ends. So you're going, take off a two, a dimer, take off a dimer, take off a dimer until it's gone. This, you can take off at, at all of these ends. So, 
properties of uh, amylose and amylopectin, we can store lots and lots of glucose in a cell. They're quite compact little shapes and we can release glucose from them fairly easily to use for energy, so they are a glucose store. Um, but one of their big properties, the one that you need to remember, is that these are now huge molecules and as huge molecules they're insoluble. Because they're insoluble it means that when cells are uh, in uh, water or they're in next to a cell with more water in it, they won't absorb that water by osmosis and that means that um, it's a very good storage compound so it doesn't affect the water balance of the cell. Another picture that you might see uh, either as a whole cell or this is part of a cell full of little starch grains so they're stored as starch grains which are a mixture of myelopectin and amylose. They stain blue-black with iodine so that's another thing that you need to know about starch. So plants storing glucose in an insoluble form so it doesn't affect osmosis in plants. Two types, amylose and myelopectin, you need to know the bonds that are available. Now animals um, store a different sort of compound, this is called um, glycogen. Glycogen again has 1,4 and 1,6 linkages, so we've got, here we've got our 1 4 linkages going along, and here's our 1 6 branch going into more 1 4 linkages. Again, it's energy storage, so we're storing glucose, but animals, of course, are an awful lot more active than plants. We've got far more 1 6 linkages, far more branched molecule than amylopectin, much, much easier to get this very rapid glucose uh, release. You also need to know where they're found. So glycogen is found in liver and muscle cells. Uh, so those glucose stores are released from those areas. And of course in plants, we're mainly talking in seeds and storage organs where you'd be storing the starch. You get starch grains uh, in all of those storage tissues. Uh, but also because the end product of photosynthesis is glucose, you get starch grains building up inside of chloroplasts. So, glycogen, so there are two storage ones. So 1,4 alpha glucose and 1,6 linkages. Our structural polysaccharides are made of beta glucose and I'll just remind you of the structure of beta glucose. So beta glucose, if you remember, is isomer Instead of having the OH group at the bottom of carbon number one, remembering that we always need to talk about which carbon we're talking about, it's at the top. Now on carbon number four, the OH group is always at the bottom, so even in the glucose isomers, that OH group is at the bottom on carbon number four. Now this creates a little bit of an issue when we come to bonding because it is very, very awkward to remove the H2O from between our two OH groups. So I'm going to do a bit of a strange shape to get the water out. And the bond would, formed would be very awkward going between there and there and it will make a horrible sort of zigzaggy shape and it will be under quite a lot of strain. So what actually happens when we're forming um, cellulose and chitin, our other structural monosaccharide, is that to release the strain on the bond, this molecule turns upside down. Can I do an upside down one of these? I think I probably can. Uh, so our CH2OH group would be there, oxygen, and then this one, because the OH group on carbon number one would be there, but on carbon number four would be there, we're okay to do that the right way round. So what you'll see is 
these monomers flipped with the glycosidic link shown up, down, up, down, up, down on adjacent um, monomers. So they're flipped not through 90 degrees but through 180 80 degrees. So we've turned it completely upside down. That's really important because that means that these these polymers of beta glucose don't make curves, they make straight chains. And on either side we've got these OH groups sticking out. So we've got one there and these will be probably involved in bonding. And because we've got OH groups on either side of the molecule they can then form hydrogen bonds with adjacent molecules. So what we're talking about is making strands in straight lines and then where we've got OH groups forming hydrogen bonds across. So this is going to make it, this is going to confer because of the number of hydrogen bonds, a lot of strength on the molecule and so in cell walls this is going to be a very strong compound and it's going to prevent because it's on the outside of the cell as the cell takes in water it's going to stop it bursting we call that osmotic lysis so just go to the pictures that you've been using in class this is quite a common picture to see we've got our chains of beta glucose molecules you can see we've got the up down up down thing going on with the oxygens in the glycosidic linkages they're going to link together by hydrogen bonds to form these structures called microfibrils again they've still got OH groups sticking out on either side so you can build them up into much larger structures until you get the fibrils of cellulose and this is a scanning electron micrograph of a cellulose cell wall and you can see they're laid down any old which way. So they're not laid down in sort of ropes or m making some kind of weaving, they're just laid down as they're secreted. This leaves large gaps between the cellulose molecules so that means it's fully permeable and if you think uh, cotton wool is cellulose, pure cellulose, if you put that underneath the tap the water will go straight through it. So just to uh, show you what's going on here. We've got the cell wall, sorry, the cell membrane, and around the outside we've got the cell wall. So osmosis that you will have done at GCSE is about water moving into or out of cells across the membrane. That, the cell membrane, is our barrier really for the water. This is not a barrier for water, it's fully permeable just because you've got all these huge gaps where it's been kind of randomly laid down so it'll not stop anything getting to the cell membrane, the cell membrane forms the barrier for osmosis. So what the cell wall forms is a nice sort of rigid, uh, fairly rigid, fairly strong structure and it'll lend what we call structural support to a whole plant. So when you're talking uh, um, in questions and it's a frequently asked question, what gives it its strength? The straight chains with adjacent monomers flipped by 180 degrees, forming hydrogen bonds and microfibrils, giving strength and structural support to the plant. So similarly, we've also got uh, this chemical chitin. Now this is an animal and fungal. Um, it's not quite what we would call a polysaccharide. Um, partly because the unit, although it's based on beta-glucose, has this additional nitrogen-containing group. So this nitrogen containing group makes it different from our normal um, monosaccharide units. But we've got, again on carbon 1, if I was to add in, that OH group would be at the top and the hydrogen at the bottom. On this one the OH group and carbon 4 would be at the bottom. So again, forming these very straight chains with lots of opportunity 
for hydrogen bonding. So here we've got the hydrogen bonds from the amino acid side chains holding it all together into this nice strong rigid structure just like the cellulose was. So what do we use it for? Um, in fungi it is the component of the cell wall so same idea as cellulose we're giving a bit of strength and rigidity and a bit of structural support to the fungi just by having cell walls made of this strong material. We also find it, it's the crunchy bit of an insect, so the exoskeleton, the bit that you would be able to touch, should you wish to, of a beetle, is made of, um, of this chitin material. And it's also very lightweight, so it enables the insects to move around more easily. Uh, so making it out of something really sort of like bone is quite heavy, would make it quite difficult to move. Um, crabs, lobsters, all of the arthropods, spiders, scorpions, all of their exoskeletons, all made of this lovely chitin. And it's, it's quite strong and it's usually covered in a layer of wax and it's quite waterproof. Uh, so not like cellulose in that respect. Cellulose fibres, uh, although they're insoluble, big gaps between them, those gaps are sort of closed up in an insect exoskeleton so it's nice and waterproof. So, what do you need to know about those four? You need to know the monomers they're made of, you need to know the shapes of the, mo of the monomers, whether they're spiral, branched, straight chained, you need to know about the hydrogen bonding between the straight chains in chitin and cellulose and what properties that confers in terms of strength and for uh, amylose and amylopectin and glycogen you need to be talking about insolubility and osmosis. Okay, hope that's been helpful.